welcome all of you this morning, and I want to welcome you to part three of our series entitled Push. Everybody say with me on the count of three, let's say push, okay, you got to drag it out, push. Y'all ready to do it? Come on, all you quiet people, come on, on the count of three, one, two, three, push. There you go. We're going to pray until something happens. That's the acronym of the word push. What is prayer? What is prayer? So far we've learned that prayer, and I hope you're listening, first and foremost is fellowship. It is communion with God. God wants to be with every one of His children. He wants to be with you. It's fellowship with our Heavenly Father. And He is a good Father. We found that out. Prayer is spending quality time with Him just like Adam and Eve did before the fall. How I many you realize that? Adam and Eve had perfect communication with God. And, and, and again, some of you say, well, I don't know about that. Well, if you understand what Jesus did, you understand that Jesus made our ability to spend time with God unhindered, flaws and all, with Him as our Father in relationship. Jesus, because of His death, burial, and resurrection, made this possible. And so now we have what I describe as unfettered, unhindered access to God. Listen, anytime we need to talk to Him. I, you know you know this, I know this, but I thought about this just the other day. I thought, when do you ever call on God? When do you ever go to meet with Him, but what, He's not there? He's the God who never, ne never sleeps nor slumbers. God is always there, available and waiting for us to be with Him. So we have this unfettered Access to God, Hebrews chapter 4 verse 16 says this. This is a great verse. It says, so let us come boldly or with confident or confidently, where? To the throne, listen, of our gracious God. He's gracious. And there we will receive His mercy. In other words, His pity, His understanding of our humanity. And we will find grace, our enablement, to help us in our time of need. That's what the Bible says. I don't know about you, but I need grace every single day of my life. Can, can I be honest with you? And I'm, I'm making a pitch. Keep praying for your pastor and his wife. Sometimes Sunday mornings can be some of the most difficult for me to kind of get ready and get things squared away and, and get here and, and get here and be in the Spirit, right? I bet some of you have that same challenge too. And I would wager to say it's probably why some don't come because they don't understand we all go through that. But we need to come to our God with confidence. God wants us to come confidently. Say, well, I, I don't feel very confident when I come to God. Well, that's, if, if you don't, it's because you're basing it on yourself and what you do and what you don't do. Now, I'm not handing out a license here to be anything you want to be, do anything you want to be, and still, you know, everything's cool with you and God. I'm talking about when your heart is for God. You're doing the best you know how, and yeah, you're messing up. You need to come confidently because you're coming to a throne of grace, amen. You're going to find mercy there. You're going to find the enablement that you need to, to go forth in your day. Now, in part two, we learn that God is a benevolent father. That He is kind and He is gracious. He is approachable. Always, always. Everybody say with me, always. Always, always available to His children. He desires to be with us. Now, I know some of you in your mind, when I say this, you're thinking, I'd like to think that too. He does. And if you haven't heard the previous two messages, maybe they'll help you. He wants to be with all of you. He desires that. And, and I love the fact that we can approach Him whenever and wherever we need to. Maybe you're at work one day and something just, just goes wacky, goes crazy, and you're thinking, oh, wow, well, I can't run to the bathroom right now, or I can't go to my car or my prayer closet, and I can't pray. What do I do? You can pray right there, wherever you are. Uh, God, now, God does say have a, a secret place where you spend time with Him on a regular basis. But how many of you know sometimes you can't always be there when you need heaven to hear what's on your heart? Amen. So you can approach Him wherever and whenever you need to. Now, I brought out this point, too. There are a lot of people who are confused about God. and Is He harsh? Is he, can He be pleased? All you need to know about God is just go and look at Jesus. 
Going, the, only, the only time you ever see Jesus getting upset was with those religious Pharisees. They were always hounding him. They had a form of godliness, but they, they really, he, he really got on to them in Matthew chapter 23. If you really want to see how Jesus feels about religious people, in fact, we're going to talk about a religious dude a little bit today. You don't want to be that guy. That's the only time Jesus ever got upset. He got upset because they had turned his house, uh, his, his house into a, a money-making machine. And God said, he turned those tables over. He said, my house should be called a house of prayer. By the way, I began this series by saying that. My house, Jesus said, should be a house of prayer. How many of you know we are his house now? First and foremost, me and you and all of us, we need to be a house of prayer before we do anything else, right? So I said all these things to get you ready to push. I think you're ready to push right now. In fact, I, I thought I, I probably should take a little more time and come up with a little better illustration with this. But, you know, you might remember this one a, a little better than some I could come at with it. But I, I believe some of you are on the verge of birthing something. And some of you say, I'm ready to give birth to something. I, I, I've been praying for this a long time, and I'm, I'm ready for this baby to be birthed. But the only image I could get in my mind when it comes to pushing is a, is, a, is a woman that's been pregnant for nine months. And that little fella is kicking and stirring and shuffling around. All you ladies should be having a good time right now. But all the men are laughing and the ladies are looking at me like, how dare him. <laughs> or either you're going and having memories, I don't know, like, oh, Lord. But at some point, guess what? Little Johnny's got to come out. Or whatever her name is, Bethany. It's got to come out. And you've got to push that baby out. Okay, now I don't wanna I don't wanna spend too much time on this. I, I think God's ready for the church to give birth to some things, right? I think we've been praying, but I, I think it's just about time to start pushing some things out, right? And putting our foot down and say that's enough. Devil, you're not going to have our nation. You're not going to have our churches. You're not going to have our families. You're not going to have our health. It's time to start praying like we mean it. Amen. Amen. So what is prayer? Well, I'm going to endeavor to in tell you what prayer is. And I've already been attempting to do that. But how many of you know that prayer is as old as man? And it's practiced in some form by all men of all faiths. Prayer springs from the heart with a need. A need greater than man's ability to encounter. Prayer is man's acknowledgement of being higher than himself. There is a being that is higher than us. How many of you realize that? I think, I'm, I think most of you here today understand that. Did you hear about the guy who volunteered to pray? Well, it goes like this. He says, when it was evident that the ship would not survive the storm, the captain called out to his crew, Does anyone here know how to pray? One man volunteered with, Yes, sir, I know how to pray. The captain said, Good. You pray while the rest of us put on our life jackets. We are one short. I've never heard so many groans and uh, uh. Don, I thought that was funny. Yeah. Uh, I thought that was funny. I mean, you groan in the spirit. <laughs> Don't be too quick to volunteer to pray when the ship is sinking. Do you know most men try to play, pray? But do you know very few know how? Did you also know there are two kinds of prayers? Did you know there is the prayer that reaches God? And did you know there is the prayer that does not reach God? Now this is illustrated uh, by our Lord in the parable of the Pharisee, the religious guy. He was, he was the religious guy of the day. He represented the, the, quote, the church of the day, except they were very religious. They didn't get along with Jesus. In fact, they wanted him dead. So he illustrates this in this parable of the Pharisee and the publican. How many of you know what a publican is? It's a tax collector. Tax collector. 
Some tax collectors today are not liked very well, right? They're just doing their job, just doing their job. Luke 18, verses 9 through 14, it says this. It says these two men went up to the same place at the same time for the same purpose. What was that purpose? It was to pray. Now listen, the Pharisee prayed in his religious pride. If there's anything that will get you turned away from heaven, it's religious pride. And he was expecting God to answer because he thought himself worthy. Now here's what he did. He informed God of his own goodness, and that he was better than others. He boasted of his good works. Listen to this. He said, I fast and I tithe. Well, thank God he did something. How many of you know this is the kind of prayer that does not reach God? You know why? Because it is a self-righteous prayer. Now, you keep in mind some of these things that I'm going to show you and some of these parables I'm going to read to you today. They come from the, from, the, from the heart and mouth of Jesus. These are not my words. And so regardless of what you've heard about prayer, what, who, who's told you this or that, I'm going to read to you the words of Jesus. And this is part of what Jesus says about prayer. So a self-righteous prayer filled with pride does not get God's attention. And then there is the publican or the tax collector and and, and his prayer. And here's what he did. He came to God in great humility, conscious of his unworthiness, confessing himself a sinner and begging for mercy. Now, this is the kind of prayer that does reach God. This is a righteous prayer. Now, I know just then, uh, some of you right now are thinking, and all those teachings you've heard. Now, keep in mind, these are the words of Jesus. They're not my words. Right? And there's a point Jesus is making, and I'll try to help us see that. Let's read the story there in Luke 18, verses 9 through 14. It says, Then Jesus told this story to some who had great confidence in their own righteousness and scorned everyone else. Kind of, we used to call them snooty. They got, they, they kind of got their nose up in the air. You know, ever, I mean, you know what snooty is. You ever, ever known anybody snooty? Don't raise your hand. They scorned everyone else. He says two men went to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee. The other was a despised tax collector. You have to understand here. Jesus is giving two extremes. The, the religious guy. The, I mean, the epitome of religion and religiosity and pride. And then this tax collector. The epitome of sin. In Jesus' day, tax collectors were, I mean... You couldn't get any lower, and in fact, if they could catch you at the right place, they'd drag you out behind a building and just beat the snot out of you. You were hated and despised by the Jewish people because usually these tax collectors were working for the Roman government. They were Jewish people exacting taxes from their own brothers. And so, these two men went up to pray. One was a Pharisee, the other a despised tax collector. It says the Pharisee stood by himself and prayed this prayer. Look, notice that. He's too holy to be around other people. Woo! Can't be around contaminated people. Some church folks are that way. I, I, I can't be around. They're too dirty and they're too uh, unholy. Well, Jesus was around them a lot. And they liked him. Very interesting, isn't it? So he begins to pray, I I thank you, God, that I'm not like other people, cheaters, sinners, adulterers. I'm certainly not like this tax collector. They're both praying at the altar. Lord, you see that tax collector over there? I'm not like him. How many of you know we can develop that attitude if we're not careful? Christians can develop that kind of an attitude. I'm not like those people who vote that way. I love it. He says, I fast twice a week. My gosh, he's doing pretty good there, I thought. And he gives a tenth of his income. Good gosh, he's a tither. Man, we'd give him a front row in the church. He fasts twice a week and he tithes. Hmm. But the tax collector, it says, stood at a distance. He didn't even feel like he could get that close to the altar. It says he dared not even lift up his eyes to heaven as he prayed. Instead... He beat his chest in sorrow, saying, Oh God, be merciful to me, for I am a sinner. Listen to what Jesus said, church people. 
I'm including me. He said, I'll tell you, this sinner, not the Pharisee, returned home justified before God. Are you listening? Here, here's the lesson, dear ones. Not that we go around as Christians living a beat-down life like we can never please God. But here, here is the lesson that Jesus, in these two extremes, is wanting us to get it. It goes on and says, For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Now, I believe there's about to be some humbling take place in America. I'm not going to get on this much. I believe there's about to be some humbling take place. You want to be humble before God right now. I'll just leave it at that. But how many of you know, even if it wasn't an election year, how many of you know this is true? We need to humble ourselves. Did, didn't, didn't James say something about humbling ourselves under the mighty hand of God that he might lift you up? I plan on uh, humbling myself so I'll be doing good, regardless of what goes on in America. Amen? How many of you know it's a rare privilege to pray? It's a rare privilege to pray to our Father. Now, I don't know that all of you are convinced of that, but it really is a privilege. Why? Because it brings us and brings you into close fellowship with God. And basically what we're doing when we pray, we are admitting, that is, if we're not doing it religiously, we're truly wanting to be with God, we're wanting to do His will, we're admitting that we have a need, and we're admitting that we have an utter dependence upon Him. So the first lesson that we should learn about prayer is you come humbly before God. Every now and then, I, I haven't heard it lately, but I, there was a period of time where I would hear certain preachers talk about prayer and how, how, how you go before God and you put a demand on God. Watch it, brother. You don't have to put a demand on God for anything. You get close to Him and God will he'll, he'll command blessings on you. You come humbly, humbly before God, and you can be real with God, I found. Now, God doesn't want to hear you bellyaching every day when you go, God, rah, 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 rah. He doesn't want to hear that. I'm, I'm going to teach you how to get your prayers answered. There is, a, there is a way, and first of all, you do need to come humbly before God. Not like, I'm, I'm just, I'm just a, you know, you've heard some of those guys, I'm just an old worm in the dirt. I'm, I'm just so unworthy. Well, you and I, in and of ourselves, that's true. But when we put on Jesus, we are worthy. And we should come boldly then to the throne of God's grace. Amen? But it's in Christ. So there's a big difference. If you're coming to God in your own strength, in your own self-righteousness, I don't want to be around you. Right? If you define the word humbly here, it means to depress, not depress as in make you feel unworthy, but, but kind of humble yourself, to humiliate, or it, and it really means in the condition of your heart. He's talking about a heart issue here, to bring low, to humble yourself. And how many of you know this is a decision that you and I make, right? This is a decision we make. It's, it's my choice if I humble myself. So the context of this story explains what humility in prayer looks like and what it does not look like. Y'all can all look this way, please. Please. What is prayer? What is prayer? Matthew 7, beginning in verse 7 through 11, it tells us what prayer is. Here's what Jesus said. Now keep in mind, I am reading the words of Jesus says, keep on asking, and you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking, and you will find. Keep on knocking, and the door will be open to you. Amen. For everyone, notice, everyone who asks receives. Everyone who seeks finds. And everyone who knocks, the door will be open. Listen now, he uses an analogy, uh, an illustration. You parents... If your children ask you, now we're talking about normal, level-headed, realistic, God-fearing, loving people. You parents, if, if your children ask for a loaf of bread, you don't give them a stone instead. Now, I know every now and then you want to take a stone. We want to, we want to revive stoning. Remember that Old Testament thing? Now, I understand that's a different matter. I didn't say you didn't want to, but the reality is you don't do that. I'm hungry, in other words. I'm hungry. Well, here, eat this rock. Here, eat this stone. You don't do that. 
Uh, instead, um, if, if they ask for a fish, in other words, provision, food, just let, let, let's go east. I, Mom, I want some supper. Yeah. I want some grub. Um, they ask for a fish. You don't give them a snake, do you? Nope. Now, some of you people say, well, I would because I like snake. You're crazy. <laughs> you sit over there in that corner. And don't you dare ever bring a snake around me. I will soon leave the spirit realm and get in the flesh realm. Big time. No, he says, of course not. You don't do these things. Of course not. So if you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give good gifts to those who ask Him? God wants to give His children good gifts. Are we, are we in agreement on that? That's what Jesus said. Jesus gave this illustration. Now, and then I hear people saying negative things about preachers who preach faith and prosperity. and Yeah, they're just one of those blab it and grab it preachers. I listen to the blab it and grab it preachers all the time. If that's what you want to call them. They're not blab it and grab it. They're preaching faith. And the church right now needs some faith. We'll see that in one of these parables. Amen. Right? Don't listen to those people. Well, they're just blab it and grab it preachers. By the way, this whole thing about prayer, and just, just what little bit I've already discussed with you, and of course I get it before you do, this is sounding pretty good to me. I like the fact that God wants to give us good things. Now, he doesn't always give them to, he didn't give me things immediately when I want them. Sometimes I have to be patient and I have to wait. I've been waiting a long time for a man cave, a nice man cave. And let me tell you, I have one now. Woo! It's nice. Tracy now has what my former man cave was. It's pitiful, but she's got it. It's her she shed. She's getting it all fixed up, though. But I waited a long time for my man cave. And for the life of me, I have no clue how we packed everything we did in the little small building and in the garage we've been cleaning out, and now there's no room left in my man cave. But I got a man cave. And I've been waiting a long time, and I've been asking God, and Guess what? God gave it to me. Debt free, by the way, and all the goodies to go in it. So praise God for it. It pays to wait till God wants to give it to you, right? Amen. And I'll leave that alone. We'll talk about that another time in my money series. Did you know that prayer is asking and receiving? Did you know it's talking with God? It's not primarily and first and foremost uh, asking and receiving. It's talking with God. But then it develops into making your request made known to him in faith. In faith. Now the above scripture is so simple on the surface that we're in danger of failing to recognize its immensity. Our Lord instructs the believers to ask, to seek, and to knock. Because these three words cover the whole spectrum of prayer. They cover the whole spectrum of prayer. So number one, prayer is asking and receiving. When you know the will of God regarding a need, whether, a, whether it be material or spiritual, you ask and you receive. This is prayer according to the revealed will of God. Now somebody said, that's the problem. How do I know the revealed will of God? You get in the good book. The Bible is God's will. There's over 7,000 promises in the Bible. You've got to spend some time. You've got to spend some years in the book on a regular basis to understand what God has promised all of His children. And the Bible says in Christ, they are all yes and amen. Can I be a little tough on some of you? The reason some of you do not know the will of God, you do not know the Bible. Well, I tried that. I... I got the one-year Bible, and I read it for one month, and that was all I could handle. I got to uh, Numbers and Leviticus, and, and that was it. Well, you need to read on through. Keep, keep pressing. And if you can't handle Leviticus and Numbers right now, move on to Psalms and Proverbs. Ooh, you get over those Proverbs, they'll help you. 
I mean, you know, Proverbs is all about practical wisdom. I think America needs some practical wisdom again. 1 John chapter 5, verses 14 and 15 says, Now this is the confidence that we have in Him, that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. And if we know that He hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petition that we have asked of Him. That's pretty good, isn't it? So you, got, you, you need to know what the will of God is. Number two, prayer is seeking and finding. When you do not know the will of God, which there's a lot of what I'll call the gray areas of life regarding a need, whether it be material or spiritual, then you are to seek His will in prayer concerning this need until you find it. This is prayer for knowledge of the unrevealed will of God in a specific need. Now here's what I have found. And I've practiced this in my life. And I tell you, until God gives you a new word or a clear directive, don't you change a thing you're doing. Amen. I see people that are going to help God out and they get ahead of God. Amen. Let me tell you, preachers are the worst about it. You don't leave your assignment until God tells you what your new assignment is. And then when He tells you, you go for it. I've watched preachers do that over and over and over, and it is a big mistake. Right? That goes for church members, by the way. He, he, he's preaching a little too tough. I don't, I don't like it. I, I'm not getting anything out of his preaching anymore. Hmm. Well, pray for me. Pray for me. Maybe I'm not... You know, I'm not, maybe I'm not getting it just right. Why don't you pray for me? No, nah, we're, we're, we're going to go somewhere else. We get fed. You know, the problem with a lot of American Christians, we're so darn fool we can't squeeze any more in. Right. We're not using what God has given us. Oh, anyway, I could... I could we got we to gotta seek and find. Jeremiah 29, verses 12 through 13 says, Then you will call upon me... And go and pray to me, and I will listen to you. And you will seek me and find me when you search me with all of your heart. Jeremiah 29, beginning in verse 12. And then number three, prayer is knocking and opening. When you know the will of God, and yet you find a closed door, which does happen. Here, 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 let me just, I'm going to interrupt myself. You don't go and kick the door down. But you keep knocking until God opens the door. Notice who opens the door. Oh, I've seen this so many times. Bless God, it, I, I, this is the door I want to go in, and, and if God doesn't open, I'll just kick the door down. Let's all line up together like a bunch of linebackers, and we'll just run through the door. We'll just knock the door down and say, The Lord did it. The Lord did a miracle. How I many of you know this kind of prayer is a tenacious prayer? It is, it is prayer for mountain-moving faith. How I many of you know knocking prayer perseveres until the impossible becomes the possible? It's also miracle-working prayer. Now again, here's a story in Matthew 17. Beginning in verse 14, I want to read this story to you. Again, this is Jesus. I thought it I thought it'd just be better just to read the words of Jesus than, than me sit here and just try to explain them to you. Here it is. Matthew 17, verse 14 says, And when they had come uh, to the multitude, a man came to him, kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is an epileptic and suffers severely. For he often falls into the fire and often into the water. So I brought him to your disciples. But they could not cure him. Then Jesus answered and said, listen, listen to Jesus. O oh, faithless and perverse generation. In other words, boys and girls, disciples, you should already know these things. How long shall I bear with you? Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked the demon. It was a demon. Oh, that's another message. And it came out of him. And the child was cured from that very hour. Now the disciples 
and I, I'm glad they did it. They waited till later when Jesus, in private, they said, then, then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, why couldn't we cast out that demon? So Jesus said to them, because of your unbelief, <laughs> because of your unbelief, there's a lot of things not happening today in the church and in America that could be happening because of unbelief. Unbelief. We believe it up here, but it hadn't traveled from here to here. You've got you to spend some time with the Lord. And he tells us how to do that in just a moment. Jesus said, because of your unbelief. It, this boy had a demon spirit. And he needed it to be cast out. There's, there's, a, there's a lot of things that need to be cast out today. Amen. Yeah. He says, for assuredly I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. I'm sure Jesus was standing by a mountain and pointing to this mountain. And nothing will be impossible for you. Amen. Listen now. He, However, this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. You know what he's talking about? He's not talking about the demon. He's talking about the doubt and the unbelief. That's the kind that goes out by prayer and fasting. See, we're not getting close to God. We're still letting our flesh run the show and speak to us. Oh, yeah, everybody got quiet and I got that look like. I'm finding myself almost discouraged at the defeatism of the church. Whatever. Just here, devil, just knock the daylights out of us and you know, we just roll with it. No. No. Here's what it says. And here's what I've said. All things are possible when you ask, when you seek, and when you knock. All things are possible. I hope you're like me. I'm holding out for some things and I'm not going to give up until I get them because I know God has promised certain things and I'm not going to quit. I'm not going to give up. And I'm not going to stop seeking and asking and knocking until the door is open. Are you with me this morning? So why pray? Well, number one, because Jesus said we ought to pray at all times. That's what he said in Luke 18 and 1. He said, then he spoke a parable. Here's another one of those stories to them. That men always ought to pray and not lose heart. Saying. See, the church needs to start getting together more in groups and praying. Amen. Like they did in the book of Acts. And quit trying to carry this load by ourselves. Because alone, guess what? I, 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 if you're like me, I lose my heart. And I want to pray with some people. I think Jesus wanted some people to pray with at his, at his greatest hour. And he, here he is going through his greatest trial. And he comes back and he says, Guys, you're sleeping. This is my greatest hour. And what are you doing? You're sleeping. Could you not tarry with me for just one hour? Couldn't you just spend a little time praying? Folks, we need to be praying together. So we can put the devil to flight. Amen. I mean, you know, God has greater things for Wood County than we are currently seeing. Yes. I can tell you. To, how many of you know he's got greater things for Church on the Rock than we're seeing right now? Yes. Oh, yeah, that was, that was a strong amen. Verse 2 says, and he illustrates his point. He says, there was a certain city. There was, there was in a certain city a judge who did not fear God nor regard man. Again, Jesus is using some extremes here. Now, there was a widow in this city. The widows had nothing in that time. I mean, widows, uh, they didn't have Social Security. They didn't have retirement. They didn't have anything. If you were by yourself, you were in a heap of trouble. And she came to him saying, Get justice for me from my adversary. And he would not for a while, but afterward he said within himself, Though I do not fear God nor regard man, yet because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her. Lest by her continual coming, she weary me. Now, Jesus is making a point here, church. We're giving up way too quick. 
She's wearying him. By the way, how many of you know the devil is this unjust judge? If Christians will keep praying and praying together, he's going to finally give up and say, I'm, I'm leaving Wood County alone. How many of you know because Wood County is a county seat, he gets a lot more attention from the devil? How many of you know county seats, it, it's, it's, the, it's where if uh, demons are going to try to affect a community. What do you think? Let, let, maybe you can see this a little clearer when you look at Washington, D.C. Yeah. Washington, D.C. is that way as the crow flies. You think there's a little hellish activity going on there right now? Oh, yeah. Well, sure. But, but we don't think about it in our community. But it happens. And I thought about this. You know we're only one block south of the uh, courthouse here in Quitman, Texas? Do you think we probably get a little more demonic attention than maybe someone in another location in this county? I think so. And the only way this church is ever going to see all that God has for it is when the Christians get out of bed and come together and waking themselves up and start praying together and, and, and resisting the devil and taking the territory that is ours. Because if Christians don't take the territory, the devil will. It's a fact. Can you tell I'm getting a little irritated about that? Can you tell I'm getting a little frustrated about that? Right, I am. I don't like the devil. I don't like demons. I don't want anything to do with them, right? And so it says, she's going to wear me out. Then the Lord said, hear what the unjust judge said. And shall not God avenge his own elect, us, the church, who cry out day and night to him, though he bears long with them. I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Amen. Speedily. Amen. If we'll just do our part together, corporately. God will do this thing speedily and we'll say, Wow, what, where, where'd the blessing come from? Yeah. And then if we don't stop when the blessing comes, it will continue. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> Yeah, never mind. <clears throat> Listen to Jesus. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? What's Jesus going to find here in Quitman, Texas when he comes back? Is he going to find faith? I hope he does. I pray he does. Because that's the only thing that's going to make a difference. That's it. Elections aren't going to do it. If the church is not praying and we, and we vote, listen, it's just not going to work. How many of you know prayer is imperative? Yeah. Did you know that we are commanded to pray? That's what Jesus said in Matthew 6, uh, 41. He, he said, watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. He said, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Now, come on, let's, let's don't over-spiritualize. I'm kind of being tough on you today. And I thought this was going to be one of those little... Nice, easy, little sermonettes. I'm not being hard on you. Don't agree with me. Something like, yeah, right. You be, yeah, you're being hard. No, I'm not being hard on you. I'm trying to get the devil out of town. Amen. He's already defeated. Jesus said, pray because the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. That's what he told him on, on that night when he came. He says, guys, are you not going to pray? Uh, we're sleepy, you know. <laughs> Tired. Worn out. I've had a hard day. Haven't we all? You think Jesus was having a tough time? Come on, guys. Pray with me, he said. I'm crying for you to kind of subconsciously or kind of hear... Come on, guys, pray with me. Amen. Got one amen there. <laughs> Number two, we pray because prayer is the only way you get things from God. James says, you do not have because you do not ask. Well, yeah. Number three, we pray because there is joy in prayer. Amen. John 4, uh, 16 and 24 says, until now you have not asked anything in my name, ask and you will receive. Why? That your joy may be full. When you get your answered prayer, you're like, Woo-wee! I look at it, that man cave every day and go, Woo-wee! <laughs> Besides, Tracy, 
She can visit that man cave, but she cannot come and put her stuff in it. Period. Gosh, anything I say about Tracy, everybody goes. <laughs> Number four, we pray because prayer will save us out of all of our troubles. Yes, Psalm 34, 6 says, This poor man cried out, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all of his troubles. Number five, we pray because prayer can unlock the treasure chest of God's wisdom. James 1 and 5 says, If any of you lacks wisdom, you need some direction, you need some understanding from God, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally without reproach. He's not going to get on to you. Oh gosh, here they are again asking for wisdom. I've already given you wisdom. How much more wisdom do you need? No, he doesn't do that. And he said he won't reproach you. We pray because prayer is a channel of power. Jeremiah 33 verse 3 says, Call to me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things which you do not know. Number seven, we pray because it is a sin to not pray. It is a sin to not pray. 1 Samuel 12 and 23 says, Moreover, as for me, far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you. I'm almost finished. We pray, number eight, because sinners can be saved when they pray in faith. What does it say? It says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, it does say they need somebody to go and tell them first. And number nine, we pray because Jesus, while here in the flesh, prayed often to the Father. 1 Thessalonians 5 and 17 says, pray without ceasing. You know what I'm attempting to do? I'm attempting to stir this church up to the place of prayer again. I heard the Lord in my spirit, not an audible voice, say to me, call Church on the Rock to the place of prayer. And I'll tell you, listen to me. I may have already turned you off by now, but I want you to listen or you may have turned me off. Everything that I'm going to be doing in this next season it's to get us ready for the days ahead so we can be strong and vibrant people. And I'm going to be doing that. And whatever subject I'm on, I'm going to take as long as it takes to bring a well-balanced uh, presentation of that. I'm going to do that with prayer. I have learned some things in these last 40-something years. And God has told me to start downloading it. And that's what I'm doing. Now, I write things in my notes because it's what I'm sensing at the time I'm writing. But I said, I don't know about you, but I'm getting excited about prayer. I personally am get, getting some hope here. I want to give you a prayer thought, and I'm going to do this throughout this series. Here, here are, here's a power thought. Are, are you hearing me? And then we're going to pray. To not pray is the most atheistic thing that anyone can do when we don't pray we're saying God I don't believe you can do anything and that's what the atheists do I don't believe in God I don't believe in praying I don't believe folks listen we don't want we don't want to be Christian atheists do we let's stand to our feet this morning And let me just say is, when we dismiss today, there will be people here at the front of the church. If you need additional prayer, if you need someone to pray with you, they'll be here. But I'm going to encourage every one of you before I pray, I'm going to encourage you. I don't know where you're at in your prayer life. I don't know if you've gotten discouraged. I don't know if you've quit praying. I, I don't know where you're at, but I'm going to encourage you to find that place in God again and start praying. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much. God, you've provided a way to, for us to be with you and communicate with you and talk to you and hear from you and get direction, have peace and joy. Although we get discouraged, we, we kind of get busy, 
which is not good. And so I'm asking you, Father, to refire this church in the place of prayer and encourage us in it. God, I pray if there's anything hindering any of us from praying to you, Father, we'd get that taken care of and we would start coming to you in prayer and meeting with you on a regular basis. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, let me tell you what we've done so far. We've talked about what prayer is. We've talked about why we should pray. What I'm going to do next time is I'm going to tell you how to pray. There is a how-to way. And boy, has the devil tried to mess that one up. There is a way that we're taught in the Bible how to pray. And I can guarantee you, if you start praying the Jesus way, you will get your prayers answered. So we're going to do that next time, everybody. All right. If you need to find out about voting and what to do, we'll have some people back at the table back there to help you a little bit. I'm available. I voted already, so maybe I can help you a little bit. But get your information, do your homework, and get ready, and let's go vote, and let's see God continue to bless Texas. Amen. All right, everybody, we'll see you next time. God bless.